Peeps at the Pan American Exposition, Ninth Visit, by Mabel Barnes. Tuesday, July 23rd, 1901. Miss Hale and I started at half after 10 for the exposition grounds, entering at the Elmwood Gate and going directly to the Graphic Arts Workshop. This is the building directly west of the Horticulture Building and on the opposite side of the canal. It is a low building with its overhanging eaves forming an urban portico, surrounding the entire building and flanked by rows of columns. The building is 140 by 40 feet and is used, as its name implies, as a workshop for the Graphic Arts Department. The exhibits include the latest machines for printing, engraving, stereotyping, typesetting, and type distributing in operation. Machines for paper and card cutting, embossing, numbering, perforating, wire stitching, ruling, folding, addressing, etc., etc., are also shown. In the exhibits under the head of engraving are examples of fine wood and wax engraving and map making. The photomechanical processes by which the engraved plate is produced by a chemical process from the photograph or drawing. Color photography as applied to the making of plates for color work is shown, as well as the gelatin process by which fine illustrations are reproduced. The most important features of the display in the workshop, however, are the printing presses in operation. These include the newest rotary and duplex machines and the best types of presses for fine book work and the printing of delicate engravings from stone and aluminum plates, which latter are being pushed vigorously as competitors of stone. Among the firms which exhibited were the Buffalo and the Niagara Envelope Companies, showing the processes of envelope making, the Courier Company displaying roller presses in operation, and the Mealy Printing Press Manufacturing Company, from whom we obtained some good color prints. From the Graphic Arts Workshop, we went to the Mines Building, which is the southernmost of the horticultural group. In size and form, the building is similar to that occupied by the Graphic Arts Gallery, and it has a picturesque situation on the Grand Canal in one of the Mirror Lakes. The principal features of interest are the natural history of gold, including the two largest nuggets found in the West, the precious stones of North and South America, American sapphires and turquoise, the telluride gold deposits of Colorado, collective exhibit of iron ores and of coal, the electric map of the mineral resources of America, great exhibit of petroleum and of its products, model of the first petroleum well, automatic handling of ores, methods of ore reduction and concentration, newly discovered diamonds from Wisconsin, azurites and malachites from Arizona, the largest natural native nugget of silver weighing 300 pounds. Gold from Cape Nome and the Klondike. The classification of mineral exhibits is as follows. Minerals, ores, native metals, gems, crystals, and geological specimens. Metallurgy of iron, steel, tin, zinc, nickel, cobalt, copper, aluminum, antimony, and other metals is illustrated by means of machinery and appliances. Exhibits of non-metallic mineral products are made, such as abrasive, grinding and polishing material, limestone, cements, and artificial stone, clays, asbestos, graphite, mica, kaolin, gypsum, silver, salts, fertilizers, pigments, arsenic, bismuth, quicksilver, silver, gold. Combustible materials include coal and coke, asphalt and its compounds, petroleum, illuminating and lubricating oils, and natural gas. The quarry products include building stones, marbles, and ornamental stones such as onyx, agates, jaspers, and porphyries. In the building, the exhibits were arranged under the auspices of the various states and independent governments as follows. California gold, asphalt, marbles, lithographic stones, and a model of the Los Angeles oil fields. Colorado, gold and silver ore. Georgia, gold and building stones. Maryland, 
building stones, coal, clay, flint, feldspar, glass, sand, and marbles. Michigan, copper and iron ore, sandstone, nickel. Minnesota, petrified wood. Missouri, quartz, zinc, lead. Montana, gold nuggets. Nevada, gold, silver, lead, copper, antimony, tin, sulfur, gypsum. Graphite, asbestos, phosphate, soda, rock salt, cobalt, pumice, petrified wood, borax, of which latter substance a mule team, consisting of 20 mules, two wagons, and a tank wagon was made, thus advertising the famous 20 mule team borax. New Jersey, building stones, slates, cements, copper, iron, and zinc ores, graphite, and graphite products. New York, Building stones, including limestone, sandstone, marble, coral shell marble, serpentine marble, and granite, flagstones, clay, slate, cements, gypsum, emery, and petroleum, a sample of which came from the Cuba oil spring, the first oil well in this country having been discovered in 1627 by a Jesuit missionary. North Carolina, precious stones. Ohio, sandstone. Oregon gold, silver, and copper ores, quicksilver, building stones, white marble, kaolin, column of black marble, asbestos, nickel, cinnabar. Pennsylvania, garnets and soapstone. Vermont, slate, marble. Washington, gold, silver, copper, lead, iron, arsenic, graphite, building stones, coal, clays, marbles, and onyx, of which a beautiful mantelpiece was made. Ontario, Canada, gold, copper, and arsenical ores, magnetic iron, mica, corundum, nickel, and terracotta. There is also a rail of pure nickel. Mexico, gold, silver, quicksilver, lead, copper, and zinc ores, marbles, onyx, building stones, and sulfur. Honduras, Guatemala, and Brazil, collective exhibits of ores and minerals. Some of the fine separate exhibits were those of the Standard Oil Company, which occupied three booths and included models and pictures of oil fields, samples of oils, axle grease, beautiful candles and crayons, Roger S. Brown and Company, which included red mountain iron ore and a cast iron plaque, and the Tiffany Company, displaying a fine collection of uncut precious and semi-precious stones. In the safe was the largest gold nugget ever found in California. Out in the east loggia of the building was a large exhibit of copper and silver ore from Alaska, and the Idaho exhibits which included gold, silver, and copper ore, jasper, and opals. There were also some little bears in a cage. We sat down in front of the building near the bears to eat our lunch before going through the horticulture building. In front of us was the Mirror Lake, at our left, the West Esplanade Court. This court contains a large basin forming in its outlines a cross. At the head is a large fountain, the crossbar emphasized by two subordinate fountains. The theme of the sculpture in the court is man's use of nature's wealth and resources. Standing at the foot of the cross by, formed by the basin and facing the horticulture building, the sculptured groups are as follows. First, there are two groups by E.C. Potter of New York, symbolizing animal wealth, the wild beast on one side, the domesticated animal on the other. In the group on the right, a bear stands on his hind legs and holds a slaughtered deer. On one side is an Indian hunter with bow and arrows. On the other, a white trapper with a trap beside him. In the group on the left, an Indian stands with a lamb in his arms. At his left is a Negro with a pole yoke and a horse collar. On his right kneels a white man with an ox yoke and a milking stool. Midway up the court are two groups by Bella S. Pratt of Boston called Floral Well, typifying the bounty and beautiful products of nature, such as are illustrated in the horticulture building. In the group on the right, Flora stands in a chariot filled with flowers, holding a garland over her head. The car is drawn by May and June, two female figures. Two children run, 
Children precede the car while DK, an aged figure with a bony hand, follows after. The chief figure of the group on the left is a man, emblematic of the harvest, who stands in a chariot filled with fruits and holds a stalk of Indian corn. August and September, two male figures draw the car. Time, with a scythe, follows, and two children precede it. The two subordinate fountains, designed by Edwin F. Elwell of New York, are named Kronos and Ceres. To indicate the eternity of nature on the left, the fruit-spreading goddess on the other to personify its yearly revival. The goddess Ceres stands in a chariot with a scepter in her right hand and in her left a staff, the head of which is an ear of maize. Two seahorses are at her feet. Kronos, or time, is represented as a winged figure standing on the back of a turtle, suggesting the slowness of time, while its swift flight is represented by a vigorous forward movement in the outstretched body and winged arms. There is the suggestion of an aged countenance through the veil, which typifies the mystery of time. The spheres in the hands represent the movement of time from sphere to sphere. At the feet of the god are elks with fishes' tails. Just beyond these two fountains are the two groups symbolizing mineral wealth, in which the nymph of opportunity calls man to unearth the hidden treasures. The group on the right represents the story of light, or gaseous mineralogy. A spirited female figure, the genius of inspiration, holds a pot of fire above her head to announce the discovery of metalworking and to show the source of enlightenment. Around are grouped male figures engaged in various phases of the craft, one carrying a molder's pot, one with an anvil, one with a retort, one crushing ore, one with a mortar and pestle, another with a blowpipe. The story of gold, or solid mineralogy, is represented by the group on the left, in which the genius of opportunity is seen calling to waken the world to its waiting possibilities. Here, the standing female figure announces the discovery of minimal, mineral wealth to a group of male figures at her feet. Behind her, one man is smelting ore, another has a gold washer's pan, and a third sits with a pick between his knees. At the head of the court is its crowning feature. This is the fountain of nature erected by George T. Brewster of New York. Nature, personified by a nude female figure, stands on a pedestal, the base of which is the earth. Her hands are lifted above her head, holding the sun. At her feet are two children, a boy and a girl, emblematic of the maternal character of nature. Below these sit the four elements, earth typified by a female figure with a cornucopia and a basket of fruits, the sea by a bearded sea god with a trident, air by a female figure crowned with a crescent and holding a winged staff, fire by a youth of Promethean type with a scepter. Below the basin rim and supporting it are groups representing the four seasons and the four winds. A fawn piping and a nymph gaily beating a triangle typify spring. Next, a male figure is lifting the cover from a flower-filled cornucopia held by a female typifying the abundance of summer. A female figure with sheaves of grain and a sickle and a male figure with lightnings and a hammer represent autumn. Winter is symbolized by a male figure with a squirrel which extends a branch of acorns and oak leaves to a mermaid with a bowl. Between the groups are male figures representing the four winds. On the base which supports the fountain are sculptured in relief the four signs of the zodiac. Around the semicircular space in front of the horticulture building is a semicircle of shrines containing the following reproductions of ancient sculpture. Vulcan, Venus, Genetrix, Narcissus, Venus coming from the bath, Antinous, and Venus with file. In general composition, the main building is formed on the plan of a Greek cross with four huge arches on the principal axes and small octagonal pavilions capped with domes filling in the corners. The building is 220 feet square and its extreme height, 240 feet. 
The cupola is surmounted by an airy lantern, the style of architecture being richly ornate. There are deeply recessed arched entrances on the four facades that from the esplanade being framed under an ample pediment ornamented with rich decorations and relief and picked out in color like the Maiolica work of Italy, forming a beautiful background to the fountain of nature. On the facade of the building, pedestals are two brilliantly colored figures, one draped with flowers, the other with garlands or fruits. Above the pedestals are two groups in relief of horticulture in a chariot drawn by lions. In the north group, she is scattering flowers. In the south, she is surrounded by fruits. After looking at the exterior of the building, Miss Hale and I went th through the South Conservatory, which contains beautiful palms, Boston ferns, foliage plants, orchids, and begonias, while the walls are hung with views of the Connecticut parks. The interior of the main building is beautifully furnished in white and green. In the center is the heroic sized model of the Goddess of Light, which surmounts the electric tower. The exhibits are divided into three subdivisions, pomology, floriculture, and viticulture. The pomological exhibits consist of apples from cold storage the entire season, many varieties of pineapples from Florida, fresh dates of the American growth from Arizona, oranges, lemons, limes, pomelos, and other citrus fruits, tropical fruits from Puerto Rico, preserved fruits from Hawaii, cranberries growing in the natural bog soil, prunes and cherries from the Pacific states, Japanese persimmons from the Gulf states, peaches from all sections, and grapes from New York and California. In addition to the exhibits of the subdivision of floriculture, in the conservatories, several acres are devoted to hundreds of beds of favorite flowers. These exhibits include hardy and exotic water plants, extensive display of newest and best cannas, 5,000 hardy roses, 2,000 summer blooming roses, several thousand new varieties of geraniums, 5,000 herbaceous plants, 5,000 dahlias, 20,000 summer blooming plants best suited for this climate, hardy shrubs, conifers, hardy trees, 150,000 spring flowering bulbs, several beds of the new Spanish iris, clematis, and other hardy climbers. A very attractive feature of the floricultural display is the water gardens up on the southern shores and in the lagoons of the Mira Lakes. Some very rare and beautiful specimens are shown in specially heated pools. In the subdivision of viticulture are shown the vine and its varieties by living specimens, cuttings, engravings, and photographs, table, raisin, and wine grapes. In the horticultural building, the exhibits are arranged according to states and countries. We noticed the following especially. Arizona, various fruits. California. California Fruit Canners Association, Palace of Canned Fruits. Fresno County, a pavilion containing all kinds of dried and evaporated fruits and nuts. Santa Clara County, a bear made of raisins. Los Angeles County, a structure made to represent an old mission, the walls of which are decorated with oranges, lemons, raisins, and the figure of an elephant made of nuts. The whole interior space of the mission containing especially fine horticultural exhibits. San Joaquin County, pottery and Rixton ware. San Diego County, fruits. State Board of Trade, fruits, seeds, and cereals. Among the separate exhibits from California are cabinet woods, redwood and redwood doors, a corn stalk 20 feet high, lemons, oranges, dates, raisins, figs, nuts, olives, olive oil, peppers, all of the common fruits and vegetables preserved in solution, wines, honey, beet sugar, silk cocoons, bra and manufactured silk, cotton, hemp, flax, wool, tow, leather, a combined harvester, photographic views of the state, and pressed wildflowers. Connecticut, apples and small fruits. Delaware, apples and plums. Florida, coconut tree and coconuts, 
palmetto plants, pineapple plants, bamboo plants, banana tree bearing flowers and fruit, mangoes. Idaho, cherries. Illinois, apples from 500,000 acres of orchards. Michigan, apples, small fruits, canned fruits, and wax bottles. Missouri, Ben Davis apples, wines, and preserved fruits. New York, apples, small fruits, nuts, and wines. Ohio, wines. Oregon, salmon, canned and evaporated fruits, fresh apples, and cherries. Washington, preserved fruits and fresh cherries and berries. Mexico, wines, liquors, and wax models of native fruits. Ontario, apples and canned fruits. On tables surrounding the Goddess of Light were beautiful displays of sweet pears. In the North Conservatory were the following exhibits. Vixen Sun, caught flowers, begonias, orchids, cacti, palms, and seeds. Jamaica, native products including ginger root, cacao, ferns, tortoise shell, coffee, etc. Buenos Aires, cordials, bitters, and mineral waters. Danish West Indies, bay rum and Florida water. Somerville, South Carolina, tea plants and products. Henry A. Dreer and Company, outside beds of tulips, hyacinth, narcissus, pansies, verbena, and canna. Inside, exhibits of seeds and bulbs. Peter Henderson and Company, large collection of plants. After we had finished looking at the fruits and flowers, Miss Hale went through the graphic arts gallery while I rested, after which we went to the midway where Miss Hale called upon Esau and Chiquita. Then we went together into Bostock's wild animal arena. Here, in cages around the walls of the enclosure, is the unusual collection of animals to be found in any zoo. Lions and tigers, elephants and camels, bears and monkeys, hyenas and jaguars but it is the performances in the arena of the trained wild animals under the direction of Bonavita Morelli and Celica, which give the show its prestige and which have won for Bostock his title of the Animal King. We were just in time to see some of the animals fed. Among the performances we saw were those of Captain Bonavita with his 15 lions, Madame Morelli with her three bears and three jaguars, the tricks of six performing elephants, among which was Jumbo II, late of His Majesty's service in India, largest elephant in captivity, man-eater, and how to carrier, a clown with his dogs, monkeys, and donkeys, and a snake charmer and her reptiles. After leaving Bostock's, we had a ride on the miniature railway and then ate our supper on the shore of the lake. In the evening, we saw the fireworks before coming home at 10.30 p.m.